Thank you, and we have the first panel to discuss power generation and transmission. That's basically how to connect the new generators to the grid. And uh, in this panel we have Ulrich Stidbeck, who is vice president in Ørsted, the magnificent oil company turning renewable, the world pioneer in that uh, transition. Uh, I have Ragnhild Katteland, uh, Executive Vice President of Nexans. Uh, Håkon Borgen from Startnet, who is on the screen, welcome. And finally, Anna Berner, who is um, CEO of the Solar Energy Association of Sweden. And uh, I will first give the floor to Ulrik. You are, as I said, a pioneer in transforming an oil company into a renewable electricity company, and you have been particularly successful in offshore wind power all over the world, but not in Sweden, not in the neighborhood of, of this country, despite the fact that we would love to have more electricity now for this future development. Tell us your ideas for the future. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Thank you very much, uh, Nexans, for the for the invitation. Yeah. Uh, so um, we have uh, indeed been one of those companies going through that uh, transformation that you have illustrated in your in your material. I suppose uh, a bit from a, um, a from a burning platform. Actually, uh, we were uh, probably one of those companies that saw the first that. Uh, fossil, uh, namely coal, was starting to become bad business. We need to find another way for us. And we, uh, we uh, tried various things, but the offshore wind uh, became our thing. Uh, Denmark is surrounded by water, and uh, 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 the North Sea uh, is, a, is a fantastic place for offshore wind. So we set ourselves to do exactly what you illustrated in your curves of uh, uh, taking offshore wind out of the laboratory, uh, applying it uh, at scale, industrializing, uh, being uh, very, very uh, attentive to, to how to scale up uh, together with many, many, many partners uh, in the supply chain, of course, because this is a, an industry endeavor. So this is where we are. We have spent the last decade in transforming the company. I think we can say today that almost tick mark to that uh, we will we will stop using coal for example in 2023 not because we want to continue until 2023 but the last coal that we use is heating up uh, the homes of people in Esbjerg <laughs> and I think we can't leave them in the cold so they will have to find their replacement first but uh, by 2023 it's it's over with coal and and uh, uh, only renewable energy and um, uh, the next decade for us uh, will be expansion, will be growth. We have uh, seen your curves, uh, we agree. Uh, we see uh, policymakers uh, making statements about commitment to decarbonization that we believe in. Uh, the number of politicians, not only in a margin, but you know, a large majority in many, many parliaments all over the world are saying this in a serious way, also because it's, it's good business for them and for their voters and consumers that, that, that we go all in on this. Uh, and we will now, uh, we have set in our latest strategy update that we will build uh, 50 gigawatt by uh, 2030, uh, of which uh, 30 uh, gigawatt will be offshore wind. And we will also invest in solar uh, and uh, onshore wind and in hydrogen. Uh, so uh, uh, they are through uh, having the ambition to be one of the global renewable majors uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a world that is, is turning renewable. So this is... You're a big global actor uh, already, but wha what are your ambitions of these 30 gigawatt of offshore? How much should be around Norway and Sweden? And so uh, where there is an ocean, where there is wind, where there is accessible uh, 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 sites, Area? Yeah. we are interested. Yeah. Uh, and uh, looking in our neighborhood, um, of course, a lot of things going on in the North Sea, but now also more and more going on in the Baltic Sea. 
we have been working together with the Polish colleagues for some time, and now they have a very, very ambitious and firm uh, program. Germany, Denmark has been in, in action for some time. Now we are seeing the Baltic states uh, moving, uh, Finland discussing it. Uh, and then we saw very early on in 2016, uh, Sweden make a decision to advance on, on offshore wind. But uh, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, we are very, very keen. We are very interested. Uh, we have our eyes on some sites also in Sweden. We think that yep. the Swedes need the power, but uh, but th we still need to work out the details. It right. Seems. So, so when you refer to the 2016 decision, it was the agreement between some parties in Parliament to, to uh, remove the uh, connection fees for offshore wind, which has not yet become a real decision. It's just an ambition so far. Right. Uh, exactly. And uh, I suppose at the time it was decided, uh, the idea was maybe that it would take some time until yep. that decision would bring offshore wind into the money. Yep. Uh, but, uh, well, you, show, you showed us the numbers before. Uh, with that decision, offshore wind is probably in the money. Yeah. Uh, today in, in, in Sweden. So it's right there. It's a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I will turn to, to Håkon now, because uh, if you succeed in developing these offshore wind projects that are of significant scales, they will affect the, the grid, the grid operator, and you are involved in, in Startnet's preparations for how yeah. to handle large shares of, of offshore wind. Can you tell us about your plans? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for, for joining this uh, seminar. I think, uh, well, my background, I'm executive vice president of Startnet. I'm also project owner of the cable projects we are now uh, uh, finalizing to UK and, and which we also finalized to Germany a uh, half year ago. And uh, it's fair to say that what is going on now, the transformation of the energy system is so large uh, that the scale in itself, I think, needs to be addressed. Um, so I will, I will just talk you through a uh, few slides, and then I will also go into your question. First thing is, is the scale of Fit for 55, driven by uh, uh, Europe, is is a global uh, forerunner in how to actually deal with the climate change, and it's it's a very high ambition we have in Europe, and all countries will be affected in a positive way. But the scale in itself is so big. So if you take the next slide, we think that what we see on, on, on wind production uh, will uh, increase by a factor of 10 compared to what we see today. And the same is on the solar. And this will give radical changes uh, of the power system in total in Europe. And we need a lot of more flexibility and the flexibility part is the key here. We, we need, of course, more a grid, and, and we need to cooperate between countries, and we need to cooperate between sectors. And uh, the innovation component is uh, inherent in this, and the acceleration of the in, in, in innovation is key in order to deliver. Next slide. What we see now is going on today. So the green shift is taking place. Uh, as you all know, no, we don't have too much wind in Europe these days. This is a simulation of what will happen in 2050. We will have hundreds of gigawatts going up and down. And how to cope with those four weeks or eight weeks without any wind, and it is even night. That is the big, big challenge we see. And we need a lot of more uh, flexibility on the demand side. So I think I just will tell you that the new situation will be that the demand will follow generation not the opposite, as we see today. And we are not there today. So we need a flexibility logic behind the demand uh, in the future, which is really a transformation also of the thinking. And of course, when we feed in a lot of hydrogen, it will lift up the prices in the power system in those times when it's too much wind. Because as explained by Ørsted, we will have a lot of wind, but we will have excess of wind, and in those hours we need to produce hydrogen in order to cope with also the, the hours when we uh, have a, 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 a large deficit. Next. So, what we now do is to plan for the grid, and one key note here is that when you plan for the European grid and also the national grid, 
we need to look on the grid offshore and onshore as a whole. We don't see the difference, whether it's wet or dry. Uh, and the scale of this, and you shouldn't forget that it's at the speed of light, uh, electricity is instant. So that in itself is a very key area for us. And also an NSOE uh, between the European Transmission System Operator, this is uh, a very clear statement. So talking about StartNet, we know plan for the grid offshore. And myself, I will actually be head of the offshore uh, development now. That will take place 1st of October. And that also shows that we are now moving ahead for the offshore activities uh, in StartNet. And final slide is just to, to underline the fact that innovation is a key coordination platform between TSOs, between, between the manufacturers uh, and also authorities. And it's a national focus, but it needs to be even more international. And in NSOE, we have developed flagships. One of them is dealing with offshore. And here, the interoperability is key. I mentioned the experience from the cable to the UK and Germany. It's a lot of lock-in problems we see. So we need to define grids in the future where you can choose among the different manufacturers, independent of who is actually uh, building it. And that is uh, interoperability challenge, which we will solve, but we have to do it together. And then we need more pilots. We need to demonstrate that this functions, and that is also part of the, of the roadmap. So that was the slide pack. Thank you. Then I can continue with the question. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Håkon. Uh, the, the, the point you made here towards the end of the need for coordinated innovation in the supply chain was also something that, that uh, Ulrich touched upon when you described how your success was building on the fact that other sub-suppliers were also developing their technologies. And, and one of the crucial technologies when it comes to offshore wind is the, the, the cable connection. And we've heard about the learning curves for, for, for wind power plants. Do you have similar now uh, demonstrated ability to reduce the cost for the cable connections? Uh, yes, uh, sure. Uh, what at first I want to, to thank Ørsted and Statnet because we have been really, together with you, pioneers in the cable, in the transmission and generation, delivering the first export cable to your first wind farm uh, in Denmark. And as well now taking part of the uh, of the uh, transmission and the uh, interconnectors to UK and, and Germany. Uh, for, for the cost side of the cables, uh, even though they for a typical offshore wind farm, uh, the cable system itself 10 to 15 percent. However, uh, what we have done the la last 10 years, if we think about the optimal solution for cable systems, we have reduced by 40 percent, more or less. Mm. Uh, of course, then thinking of front-end engineering, taking part of the development, uh, optimizing the system, monitoring, all these things. Uh, so the cable systems are se it's, uh, themselves, we have been able to optimize together with, uh, with Startnet, with Ørsted, a, a giant step right. forward. So a 40% decrease in the cost of the cabling, and that's keeping pace with the development of other parts of the, 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 the wind power installation. So you, you kept the 10-15%, but at a lower level. Is that the conclusion? Yeah, that, 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 that is correct. Well, what is also important is that we always talk about the cost of the CapEx, but we also need to talk, talk about the operational cost later yes. on. So the total life cost of a, of a cable system. And here we are together with the clients monitoring uh, supply chain. We have to think about how to, to drive these forward to the most optimized manner to have the lowest cost long term. Yeah. Uh, Christophe Guerin in his introduction mentioned the, um, the new cable uh, laying uh, ship that is going to be <laughs> in operation. Uh, another part that will become more important, as you indicated now, is the, the maintenance and the repair. Mm. Uh, uh, how much has that evolved over the last few years as you gain experience now of uh, some cables maybe having perfect quality, but there are also ships anchoring on cables and things like that. So th there are reasons to re repair them now and then. Uh, is that an innovation process that, that is also evolving cost-wise in a similar fashion? Yes, clearly, and uh, and also the outage period is very important for these uh, these links, both for an offshore wind farm and as well for an interconnector, uh, and to be prepared and to have all these 
uh, upfront engineering done, upfront planning done, we can reduce the time of a chip of an outage by 80 percent. Mm -hmm. So, so from from if worst case, you can be up to one year. Actually, if nothing is prepared, we can go down to one month or less, much less than this. Uh, and also, when you talk about the installation vessel uh, behind me here, I don't know if you see it on the screen, but <laughs> uh, we have the next Aurora. And also, from efficiency standpoint, uh, with this vessel, we can also install two cables bundled, uh, so much more efficient as well, ready to to ready to go if there is a repair situation coming up. Yeah. What we also do, uh, and this is also together with the clients, insurers, etc., is to plan ahead the risk management and how to foresee what could happen. Uh, and as long as you have good planning, uh, the cost and the time will definitely will be reduced. Thank you, Ragnhild. Uh, Ulrich described the uh, fantastic development of offshore wind power in the world and the total absence of offshore wind power in Sweden. No, not total. <laughs> we have Lilgrund, which is quite a good performing early low cost offshore wind plant. Uh, with solar, it's rather similar. Uh, what we have seen in Sweden is the development of a, a rather vigorous uh, 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 rooftop solar market, but so far very few large ground-mounted solar plants. And despite I indicated in the introduction that if we were as efficient as those building solar plants in Saudi Arabia, we should be able to build them at unsubsidized profitable cost as well. What's happening, Anna Werner? You're yeah. heading the Solar Energy Association. You should know. Yeah, thanks for being here. I think, uh, yeah, and we have no offshore uh, solar plants yet in, in no, Sweden. No, not either. There's one being built in uh, in Norway, but uh, uh, so we're waiting for that uh, on the lakes and so. Um, well, we have a fast development on the rooftops because uh, micro producers have been privileged and still are. There is a green reduction helping that market. So we have both Swedish companies and foreign global companies coming into the Swedish market. But of course, everybody looks at Sweden and, and the now very high uh, electricity prices in the so south of Sweden. And so I have many companies coming to Sweden looking at this market and they want to build huge parks. Mm. Uh, the biggest park in Sweden is now 14 megawatts, which is very small on an international scale, and it's mm. in Strängnäs, in the mm. Lake Mälaren Valley, close to Stockholm, where we are. So it's very small. The problem is that the best conditions for solar in Sweden are in the south of Sweden, where you have uh, the electricity consumption and mm. the the sun uh, many uh, days of the year <laughs> flat uh, good uh, land for you know deploying a park very fast it takes a couple of weeks sometimes less um but also that is where we grow our food and mm. we only have 45 um, percent of our food mm. is like self-sufficiency so there's a clash of interests so. Well, th there is also a, a good European report now on, on solar agriculture, yeah. where the benefits of, of mixing the two is Yeah, uh, I think agrivoltaism no. will be much easier to, to deploy in Sweden, because no. uh, and also in the north, where if you have these vertical racks that go from north to south, and you can mm. take the morning sun and the evening sun mm. instead of getting all these no. kilowatt hours during, uh, during noon, that's great for Sweden. But we also want, of course, the, the traditional uh, parks with the silica, uh, silica modules. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that is not possible right now be because we don't get the permission. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that's, uh, it's been the same for wind, but we have different uh, uh, processes. But I think while you have the municipalities stopping you in Sweden, uh, we have the like one level before that stopping mm. solar because they look at this ground and they say, but this ground is perfect for growing potatoes. So mm. then you should grow potatoes oh. and not anything else. Even though I can tell you, you, you earn much more money and it's much more easier to have a, a solar plant and grow electricity. No. <laughs> You can another go on vacation while it's working. And so. Another problem with solar is that, at least in Sweden, it's totally invisible in, in the electricity statistics. Yeah, uh, but it could even this summer when we did, you know, during uh, midsummer in no. June, I knew I knew we were our production was larger than in this uh, Svenska Kraftnät. Yeah. Uh, they have this uh, rest, like... No. 
yeah. all other uh, electricity, all but we weren't even there. So all, all other is <laughs> less than the, uh, <laughs> the the solar generation, which can now be up to one and a half gigawatt. If yeah, yeah, really we maybe one and a half gigawatt. Yeah, oh. if you count it uh, generously. So we, we may expect a contribution of uh, about one percent of glo Swedish electricity production this year. It's ab about one percent this year. It will be maybe one point six next year, I say. No, and then. So rapid growth from a low level. Uh, we will be in the statistics in a year from now, I can promise you. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, back to the, uh, uh, the, the offshore uh, development. Uh, uh, Håkon, in your slide you had this um, uh, North Sea uh, wind um, symbol. And one of the, the areas uh, in Europe where, where there is an enormous potential is the area Doggers Bank, the, the Norwegian, uh, Danish and, 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 and British coastline. And the need again for collaboration and, and uh, a joint effort to build the infrastructure and to, to have a planning procedure that can avoid unnecessary costs is, is, is vital for this development to be successful. Uh, what collaboration are you involved in, Håkon, with the other transmission grid operators around the North Sea, and how is the planning uh, done in practice? Well, I think we're moving into a new area. Um, we have done a lot of the, the grid development uh, between the Nordic TSOs uh, in the Nordic uh, uh, planning uh, relationship. Uh, what we will see in the future now is that around the basins, like in the North Sea, the TSOs uh, which are around this uh, will have to cooperate, and we do. So it's it's twofold. One thing is what we do through this uh, European Transmission System Operator uh, uh, and SWE organization, which is a very important area, but it will also be um, cooperation between the TSOs direct. So we will, of course, now move into a new phase where we are looking into different concepts and uh, find out what is the socioeconomic viable solution in the long run, because we have to also look on the resilience issues, as I explained, and also on the value of connecting different countries. And what we see is that the hybrid grid in itself is better than a radio if you are moving far ahead offshore, like in the, in the southern part of the, mm -hmm. the North Sea area. So we have to then look into this together. Um, and we are moving into that now. And that's one reason why I'm taking over in this new job now from the 1st of October. So it's actually a new stage of the, the grid development, which you now is moving offshore. And it's very important and very interesting, I, I would say. Yeah. Do, do you have an idea, uh, maybe Ulrik uh, has also, of the order of magnitude of the total investments and the sort of business opportunities in, in, in the North Sea? How many hundred billion Norwegian or Swedish crowns will be invested in the coming decades? <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's, I don't have the figure. Uh, I, what I can say is that we're talking about 300 gigawatt of uh, offshore wind. Uh, and maybe Ørsted can uh, help to provide in figures of what one gigawatt of offshore wind will cost. But if you go onshore, it's about 10 million. If you go offshore, it's, it's a higher factor, so it's maybe the double. Uh, but it's enormous uh, volumes of investment in the wind, but also in the grid, uh, which will be substantial and high. So one interconnector is, is costing about 1.7 million euro each today, uh, when we build to Germany and, and to the UK. And, and similar figures will, of course, arise when we connect this into hybrids, but you also have the cost on the top sides and, and the offshore infrastructure on top of that. Uh, but what we see is that it's, it is likely that we, within 2030, uh, can see that we have sound business case without any support for offshore wind in the southern part of the North Sea. And then that's only eight years down the road, and then we include the grid. So, so this will happen, and it will go quite fast, and that's why we now have to, to act and to be uh, as aligned as we can. And I also think that we have to talk a lot with, with uh, wind generators like Ørsted, Equinor, and the big ones, uh, in order to come up with common good solutions uh, in, in, in this concept we're talking about. So what was the, um, the, the result here of the uh, multiplication that uh, Håkon presented? So if, if Håkon, he continues to 
talk a little bit more, I will I will do the math. But uh, at the top of my head, I would I would I would think <laughs> uh, five, six, seven hundred billion euros uh, uh, in that right. neighborhood. That that I, uh, I think I think you're right because I got the same number. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a professor. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so so I must uh, be wrong. But if if I may add here, uh, having the word uh, ta having taken the word. Uh, I think uh, those scales and those magnitudes also that Håkon talks about um, is highlighting uh, an issue that we will have to deal with on policy yeah. uh, in two levels that are new to us. One thing is the sheer scale of things. Actually, the 300 gigawatt Håkon mentions is, is without the Brits, and I think they still want to be part of Europe, ah. uh, not uh, so oh. it's actually 400 gigawatt probably, including the Brits. Um, and um, to do that, today we have 25 gigawatt, I think, in Europe. Oh. So we will have to probably from 2030 to 2050 build the same amount every year that we have installed today. Oh. We will have to start to talk about not only wind farms, but clusters of offshore wind farms. Right. We will build uh, uh, hundreds of Eiffel Tower sized structures in the ocean. And we can only do that if countries cooperate. There mm -hmm. is no single market that can absorb that. So we will have to start connecting uh, uh, offshore wind clusters with more markets. And that will require policy in a new way. Uh, so that's one group. Uh, wh where we have seen so far uh, politicians and policy making dealing with uh, uh, making the market hands off, uh, yep. uh, loving the market, and and ha uh, handing out subsidies. That's that's gone. And the second area, uh, also going back to one of Hokon's uh, comments, was that uh, at the top of my head, the European Commission has said that electricity consumption will increase with 150 percent by 2050, a, a massively capex intense sector right. expanding 150% in uh, three decades. Uh, so and, and that's with energy efficiency. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Sorry. So if, if, if the, the total investment in the North Sea will be about 8,000 billion Swedish and Norwegian crowns, that's 800 mil billion billion euros. And you get 10 to 15 percent for the uh, grid connections. So what what market share do you intend to <laughs> grab of, out of that? Um, well, this market. is not official figures. <laughs> <laughs> don't talk about market uh. share. You don't talk about market share now. Okay. Definitely, we will be part there. You will be part of it. And and will will you and your uh, peers? be able to scale up, because I think that was Ulrich's main point here, that if this is to be made into reality in, in a decade or two, there is a massive need for scale up, mm. and the time lags in scaling up the supply chains. Will you manage? Aurora will not do all of it, right? No, it's not only Aurora, but of course we are we are scaling up. We, we have expansion plans and uh, started in, uh, in Halden, Norway, we have done it just in Charleston, and uh, yes, oh. this is definitely something that we're looking at. But I think also it's important that we are working together as pioneers to find new solutions as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe quicker f more products to the market, uh, other types of project solutions. So, uh, right. I think we're getting there. Thank you all. We have now heard of fantastic business opportunities in the order of hundreds of billions of euros over the coming years with profitable development of electricity supply only from the, uh, from the North Sea. And then we have the Baltic, Ulrich, also. Huh? So there is uh, an enormous potential with opportunities, uh, but it will require a major effort in, in, in scaling up. I now thank you, and we will have another set of panelists who will discuss more on how to get this power to the customers. So thank you all. <laughs>